I want you, if you have a Bible with you, you can look it up. If you have, you know, whatever you can look for, whether it be on a phone or whatever. Um, I want to share a promise with you in Ezekiel chapter 36. And I'm sharing this with you because I desperately needed this. Everything that I share is not because I sat down and figured I need a message to tell others. It was because I was battling and crying out for God to save me. And he did. And he did you too. Listen to Ezekiel 36. And I'm going to skip through the verses. I'm reading from verse uh, 24, and I'm going to go through 36. But I'm just going to pick a couple of highlighted verses in there. Ezekiel 36, verse 24 through 36. Thus saith the Lord, For I will take you from among the heathen, verse 24, and I will gather you out of all countries, and I will bring you to your own land. God promised he will bring us out from among the heathen. Do you remember that thing that Seventh-day Adventists use so much, come out of her, my people? Yes. Babylon. It doesn't mean that, that God doesn't love everybody out there, but he wants to pull you out from among the people that are, are not serving him and that will wind up being destroyed. He says, when I bring you to your own land, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. It means water that cleanses you. It's not pure water. It's water that purifies. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness. Did you hear that? How many people in here have ever messed up before? I mean, like with God. You did something you knew you should not have done. Everybody needs to raise their hand. Yeah. If you're not, you're lying, and that's, you already are out. Every single one of us, man, it's like I want to tell you all so much, and I'm trying to hold back so I don't spoil the end of the story. I'm going to spoil a little bit. I just got to do this. Okay. I need you to use sanctified imagination just for a minute, okay? That means I don't have a chalkboard up here or a dry erase board, but just kind of picture in your head what I'm writing. I'm going to write a phrase on this board, this, you know, pretend board, okay? Is everybody good with that? Yeah. How about you? Yes? Okay. She was like, I hope he doesn't say anything to me. This is a phrase we all know. It's called the law of... Who? God. Right. The law of God. Now I'm going to write this up here. The law of God. Growing up, the way that I saw the law of God was you better do this or else. And I, I was terrified of that. God said, don't commit adultery. And I was like, I'm not even married. I'm only 16 years old or 18 years old or 12 years old. That's not a problem. And then I read where Jesus said, oh yeah, by the way, if you look at a woman with desire or lust, you've already committed adulterer. And I was like, I'm dead. I mean, I'm dead. Because I would, I would, being in school, I mean, y'all know there's people that God has just... You, you find them attractive. So I'd be in school and I'd, I'd see some girl walk by and I'd go, oh, I can't look at that. And I'd go, I can't look at that. What was it, the color? What was the color of the dress she was wearing? It is still in my head. And Jesus said, if you thought about it, you've already done it. And I was like, I gave up on God. I was like, I can't be saved because I can't cleanse my own heart. I can't fix my own mind. What I didn't realize is that was the whole purpose. God told us to do the impossible so that we would realize we have to go to Him. So He gave us the law of God. Guess what the word God is in Greek? What? Theos. Do you know what the word Theos means? It only has two definitions in Strong's Concordance. Divinity and deity. The law of God is not some arbitrary set of rules that he made up and said, I think I'll make everybody upset and tell them they can't do what they really want to do. It's the law of being divine. 
It's the law of... Okay. Let's see here. Let's say that I was from Jamaica. I was born there. Native. I can only be Jamaican if my mom and dad were Jamaican. Right? I mean, I can't be Jamaican by birth if my parents were Eskimo. Or Chinese, right? Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. An apple tree can't produce oranges, can it? No. An apple tree, it doesn't matter how bad you try to make oranges come out of an apple tree, it can't do it. Do you know why? It's not its nature. God has written a law inside the apple tree. I'll give you an example that's easy for me to understand. How many people in here own a computer? How many people have an iPhone? Okay, seriously, how many people in here have an iPhone, a laptop, an iPad? Okay, all of those computers come out of the fact, have you ever bought one brand new, you got it brand new and you smell it, you go, it's new, and, and you turn it on and everything works perfectly, right? Brand new phone, brand new computer, and you're like, oh, it works beautiful. Eight months later, guess what? It's got viruses, it's got bugs, it's got malware, and it's not work, and it's got to be defragmented, and that's called corruption. The code, the code that the creator of that computer put in the computer has become corrupted. God put the law of life inside of us. Ellen White says the law of God, the law of deity, is written inside of every cell, every nerve, every organ of our body. It's the blueprint of how to be the sons and daughters of God. And what happened is, is the enemy said, I can corrupt the code. I'll put a virus in there. And you know what happened? We've been going downhill ever since. God wants to put his law back inside of us. He wants the law of life to be inside of our hearts. You know why? Because out of the heart is the issues, the springs of your entire life. What goes through the heart every second that you're alive? Blood. blood. What's in the blood? <coughs> Cells. Every cell of your body gets information and life from passing through the heart. Where does Christ want to reign? In the heart. If he reigns in the heart and a cell comes through there that doesn't match the blueprint, you know what he does? He's sitting there and he's watching the, the line go by with all the cells and he's like, wait a minute, what is that one doing there? What's wrong with you? And the cell goes, I got messed up. I'm from the foot and they did something or, oh, I'm from the ear. Somebody stuck a big hole in the ear and it messed up the whole ear. God's like, who put that hole in your ear? What? You mean there's one in the eyebrow too and there's one in the tongue? Who told them to put holes in their tongue? And if somebody's got that, don't be offended. I'm just saying that wasn't the way we were created. God put a perfect code inside of us. And the code says you never have to trade this one in. You live forever. Hallelujah. I'm going to get fired up about that. Now let me show you why that matters. Listen to what the Lord said here. I hate standing behind things. I thought there was a wall between us. He says, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. How much filthiness? All. <coughs> all. There's nothing you have ever done that God is not willing to forgive you for. And not just forgive you, but cleanse you from all and righteousness means holiness, purity, innocence, and perfection. To be cleansed from all imperfection. He says, I will clean you from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Everything that steals your affection, God promises, I'll take it out of there if you'll let me. And then he says in verse 26, oh yeah, by the way, 
a new heart also will I give you. He doesn't say, I'll create a new heart inside of you. He says, I'll give you one. What's the difference? What if I tell you, what if I come over to your house and you're having a problem with your bicycle or with your, you've got an extra something you're working on, a project. I'm like, I'll help you fix that up. God didn't come here. He didn't send Jesus here to fix us up. We're broken. We're utterly undone. It has to be brand new. I don't want, if I go to buy something, I don't normally say, I want a refurbished computer. Yeah, but you can get it for half price. I'm like, I don't want a refurbished computer. I want one that is brand spanking new. Do you understand what I mean? Yes? He says, I'm going to give you a new heart. And you're like, okay, Lord, where are you going to get this heart from? Well, Jesus says, I've got a clean heart. I'll give you my heart, a heart transplant. I've got a new mind. I'll give you my mind. Let this mind be in me, which was in Christ Jesus. And then he says, a new spirit will I put within you. And I will, that's God's will, take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And this was not even in the message. This is just the warm-up, the preview. Have you ever heard Christians say, I know the Ten Commandments are important because God wrote them in stone. They stand fast forever. Have you ever heard something like that? You know how long the Ten Commandments lasted in stone after God wrote them? Less than 40 days. He didn't write them in stone so they would last forever. Zechariah says he wrote them in stone because we made our hearts like an adamant stone. He never intended our hearts to be stone. He wrote them on, on stone because he was saying this is how your heart is. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says, God wants to write his law in our hearts, not with ink like Moses had to do in the book, not on tables of stone, but on the fleshly, the, the soft tables of our heart. That's what God has promised to do. He says, I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And then you go down a little bit farther, and he says, in verse 33, he says, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, in the day, one day, all the iniquities of the world were laid on Jesus. What day was that? Calvary. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, the Lord laid on him the iniquities of us all, the entire human race. Have you ever felt guilty for doing something that you knew you shouldn't have done? I mean, I have. Has anybody ever felt guilty before? I've gotten, I've had times before where I would backslide and I would fall. I don't want to say fall. I knew what I was doing and I rebelled against God. And then I would get up the next morning. I didn't even want to go talk to him. I didn't want to open my Bible and I was like, I've got to. And I'd go open the Bible and I felt like I was reading a newspaper. It was like there was nothing there. I was like just, just words. And I would cry out to God and God, he would finally say, Eric, the only way you'll hear my voice again is if you believe that Jesus has already paid for that sin that you just did. And the moment that I believed that, I said, Lord, thank you for forgiving me. I've confessed it. You promised you would forgive me. Thank you. And boom, the cloud would disappear and light would be there again and I could read this. He says, in the day that I have cleansed you from your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities and the waste places will be built. It means everything that's torn down and messed up in your life, I'll fix. And the desolate land shall be tilled. And they shall say, this land that was desolate, verse 35, has become like the Garden of Eden. It's pretty here in Maine. But if you look out here, it's dusty. Uh, there's some places out there that are not the most beautiful. It's not like you want to go sit down and have a picnic in the middle of the dirt, right? Except for you young guys. I know how you are. But do you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's pretty, but it's not lush. Have you ever seen a place where the grass looks so soft that you thought, man, I could lay down there and go to sleep? Yeah. It was green. 
and fresh and soft. You know, wasn't too hot. It was perfect. He said, I will make the, your wilderness like Eden. Now look at verse 36. He says, when I do this inside of you, then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places, and I plant that which was desolate. For I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Hallelujah. I promised it. Why don't you believe me? And we go, I don't see you. And God is like, it's because you haven't opened your eyes. Ask me, and I will show you my glory. God made a promise to that, and there's a reason why I'm sharing that with you. I'm going to say a, a, a prayer. Let's ask the Lord to be with us, and then I want to dive into the message. Father in heaven, every person here today is your child. You love us with an everlasting love. Father, you know the thoughts that you think towards us, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Your greatest desire is for us to take hold of every promise you have given us in your Son. Father, we ask for your blessing, the fullness of your blessing today, for every individual and every family that is represented here at this camp meeting. You promised you would pour out your Holy Spirit in the latter rain power. Father, we claim that promise today. Fill us today as never before with your presence. Cause us to hear your voice and to share the glad tidings with others. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. The title of our message, and I, I appreciate you all being patient. We need to pray that we, the Lord will make a way so that we can show things where they're clearer. It's easier to see. The title of the message is called Ichabod. Has anybody ever heard of that word before? Yes. Have you heard it from the Bible, or did you hear it from that story called Ichabod Crane? On the Bible. <laughs> I don't know about that story of Ichabod. Okay. The word Ichabod, it happened in the Old Testament when um, Samuel, he had two sons which were not good priests. And I think it was, was it Samuel or was it Eli? No, no, Eli. Eli. No, Samuel did too. Yes, Samuel You'll have to forgive me. Right now it's, I'm drawing a blank. But was that Eli or Samuel? Okay. Eli's two sons, they all, all of Israel was going out to battle, going to fight Satan, even though Satan was look, looked like men. And they knew they couldn't win when they got to the battle, and so they said, you know what we need? We need the Ark of the Covenant. Anytime the Ark goes in front of us, we always win. You know why the ark caused them to win? It was the throne of God. If you take God into battle with you, you can't lose. But their sons, those two young men, they were not serving God. So they took his throne, which is the Ark of the Covenant, and God didn't go with them. He's like, you guys can take the chair, but I'm not going with you. And they went into battle. And in the battle... They were killed. And this messenger came running back and he said, the Ark of the Covenant has been taken by the Philistines. I mean, can you imagine? The throne of God was stolen by the enemy, the pagans. And, and it was Samuel, right? No, Eli. Eli. Eli was like, it broke his heart. He was like, this is terrible. And then the messenger said, well, the news is worse. Your son died. I may have had that backwards. Maybe the son was, he told him the son had died first and then it was the ark. When, the, when he told him the ark had been stolen, Eli had a heart attack and he fell and broke his neck and died. And his, his son's wife, who was pregnant with a baby, that's what she cried out. Ichabod. It means the glory has departed. Do you remember what sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant? He had two cherubs. What was in between those cherubs? The, uh, the, the mercy seat and the glory of God. Without the throne, you can't have a king. Do you know how scary that was for Israel? They were like, 
we let his throne get, get stolen, he is going to be mad. <laughs> I mean, we let our king's throne get taken. <coughs> she cried out, Ichabod. Adam and Eve, she named the son that was born that, Ichabod. Imagine, though, Adam and Eve, and we talked about this the other night. Adam and Eve, they were clothed in what? Light. The glories departed. The throne of God was the Ark of the Covenant, but it was really a symbol of the heart of man, where the law was to be kept. The glory on the Ark of the Covenant was gone. The glory within mankind also left when Adam sinned. He lost the robe of light. That's why him and Eve were like, we've got to make some clothes. And they made fig leaves. I mean, can you imagine? Really? Fig leaves. They were glowing before, and now they've got fig leaves. Satan has made it his study to lay the temple of God in ruins and to obliterate the image of God in man. By yielding to sin, men have become defiled and corrupted. For ages, Satan with his evil angels had been seeking to control the bodies and the hearts of men. Do you know that Satan could not control people in the beginning like he did when Jesus had gotten here? Ellen White even says that. She says, by the time that Christ came to the earth, Satan and his evil spirits had figured out how to get inside of man completely. Before that, it was touch and go. There's, there's almost no references <laughs> to somebody being possessed. I know Saul and possibly you know, one other, like the witch of Endor. But there's no real references about people being possessed of evil spirits. Satan was trying to figure out, because you remember in Desire of Ages 161, Ellen White said God, from the very beginning, it was his purpose to dwell inside of every created being. And Satan was like, that's how God reigns. He gets inside of them. I've got to figure out how to get inside of them. And it took a while for him to figure that out. For ages he was seeking to control the bodies and hearts of men and to bring upon us sin and suffering. And then he charged all this misery upon God. When Satan has undermined faith in the Bible, he directs men to other sources for light and power. That's why people get involved in, in all this New Age stuff and Eastern stuff. They say, man, I go to church, I don't see God's power there. I see power over there. That's why people get into witchcraft. They're like, we got power. We should have that power, and we should have it a thousand times greater. Higher criticism. How many people have ever heard of that before? Higher criticism. It's called the critical method of Bible interpretation. That's being taught in almost every theology school in our country right now, not just Adventists, all denominations. Instead of doing the historical way of doing it, the way our pioneers did, which was proof text, it means if I need to find out about the Sabbath, I open up the Bible and I read every verse in the Bible that has the word Sabbath in it. And as you're doing that, God brings the pieces of the puzzle together. They don't want to do it that way. They say, no, you've got to read the text, and you've got to understand this context, and you've got to look at the people that, that were writing it and who they were talking to, and that changes everything. No, it doesn't. Exodus was written for me just as much as it was for them. And people say, well, that was for their time. Things have changed now. No, it hasn't. When God comes back, he's not coming in a, a motorcycle or a Rolls Royce. He's going to be riding a horse. He's still wearing clothes like he wore 6,000 years ago. Just because we've changed doesn't mean God has. Higher criticism and speculation concerning the scriptures have opened the way for spiritualism and theosophy, those modernized forms of ancient heathenism to gain a foothold even in the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Madam H.P. Blavowski. And we're going to have these things online, and I've also got some other videos that are available here and we have online where if you can't see it good enough, 
you can go online and watch them on YouTube. The symbol for her theosophical society is up at the top. You see that triangle with the sun in the middle of it, and there's a snake wrapped all the way around the outside edge, and the serpent is swallowing its tail. That's a symbol that represents reincarnation, but it also represents that the power to live comes from within yourself. Jesus said, eat of my flesh and you'll live. My word. The occult says, you eat of yourself. You look within yourself. You look for the God that's in you, not to the God that's up there. This picture I know is a little bit difficult to see, but over here is the Buddha. And here is a statue representing Jesus Christ. And in the middle is the word meditation. That's happening right now. They're trying to blend Eastern thought, pagan thought, with Christianity. Side by side with the proclaiming of the gospel, agencies are at work which are but the medium of lying spirits. Many a man tampers with these merely from curiosity. Have you ever done that before? When I was in a Seventh-day Adventist school, I believe I was in seventh, I think I was in sixth or seventh grade, I had another little boy, young boy, I don't want to say little, but a young man compared to how I am now. He sat beside me, and we had like a break. And he pulled something out and started working on it. He had a book, and he had papers, and he was writing. And it wasn't schoolwork. And I was curious because I saw like a picture of a dragon or something in the book. And I went over beside him. I was like, what is this? He said, oh, it's a game. It's called Dungeons and Dragons. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yeah. Most people do computer games now, but that game is one of the most popular occult games in the entire world. I played that game for years. There's spells in it. There's sensuality and immorality and lust and violence and witchcraft. It's all in the game. And you have to pretend that you're one of the characters in the game. So I say, I want to be a warrior, or I want to be a wizard. And then I get to design how I want to be, what I want to look like, what my powers are. And you go through this game like a video game, except it's all done on paper, and you, you learn how to gain more ability and more power. That game opened up a world of darkness into my life. My family, my mom didn't know any better, and she was like, you know, what would you like for Christmas? I was like, I'd like some more of the books that go to this. And she was like, she, she said, I didn't feel comfortable about it, but I didn't know how to say it was bad. And she bought the books. My grandmother bought me books. And here I was bringing these occult books into my home, and that gave the devil the right to come to my home. Many a man tampers with these merely from curiosity. But then, seeing evidence of the working of a more than human power, they are lured on and on until they are controlled by a will stronger than their own, and they cannot escape from its mysterious power. Sometimes we go out to people um, in our church or in our neighborhoods, and we say, you need to quit smoking. And they go, man, I've, I've tried for the past three years. And you're like, you just got to try harder. Set your will and do it. If that was how salvation came, the strong-willed would gain heaven and the weak-willed would be lost. A man can choose to do what's right if his will is still free. But once a person has yielded their heart and their will to Satan or to evil spirits, often they lose the ability to even choose what's right. They want to, but they can't. They can't stop themselves. Do you want to know something? That can happen even with food, and I know from experience. I could, I could go to Sabbath afternoon lunch, and you know, fellowship dinner. There's 52 bowls of different foods, all different kinds of mixes. Who knows what that does in the stomach? And I would go there, and I'd be like, Lord, I'm not going to overeat. And next thing I'd find was 30 minutes later, I was back getting my third or fourth plate of food. And I wasn't fat. But I'd go home after I left fellowship dinner and I'd lay down on the bed and fall asleep for four or five hours because I, my mind was shut off because my body was trying to get rid of all that food I'd overeaten. And people would say, you just got to set your will. And I was like, man, I've tried setting my will 
for years. And then I found where Sister White said, if you want to overcome that demon of appetite, she said, look at Calvary in the wilderness and know that his victory over appetite is yours. And I had to say, instead of, Lord, help me, I started saying, Lord, I'm sitting down, I'm setting this food in front of me. I thank you for blessing this food, and I also thank you for your victory over appetite. Cause me to see food through your eyes. Give me your desire to eat what is right and only as much as I need to. And as I'm doing that, I'm getting stronger and stronger victory in that area of my life. We can have victory. I'm going to just glance through this. Ellen White said she had a vision. And in this vision, she, she saw a train of, uh, a, a whole train of cars. You understand what I'm saying? Actual train cars. Like a caboose and a you know, conductor at the front. And she said it was a huge train. And she said the whole world was on board this train. The entire world almost. And she looked at the front and she saw the conductor and the conductor looked very important. A wealthy man. Fine dressed. And she asked the angel, she said, who is the conductor? Because everybody on the train looked up to him. The angel said, it is Satan. He has taken the world captive and they are all going with lightning speed to destruction. This delusion of spiritualism will spread and we shall have to contend with it face to face. And unless we are prepared for it, we shall be ensnared and overcome. This is serious. Spiritualism, I know one day somebody could have a dead relative show back up and we know that's a demon. It's not really the dead relative. But that's not what she's talking about alone. Spiritualism, we will have to face face to face. We saw Robin Williams and Denzel Washington and Oprah Winfrey and Beyonce and Nicolas Cage. If they get on the television and they have asked an evil spirit to come into them to help them act, you're watching a demon and you're listening to a demon while you watch that television show. Literally. They are inspired by evil spirits. Now here's a verse most of us have heard. This is from Matthew 24. Jesus was talking about the end of the world, and his disciples were asking, what's going to happen to let us know that, that your coming is close? He said, when you therefore shall see the abomination that makes desolate, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Daniel talked about an abomination that would make desolate. Do y'all remember? Have you ever heard this before? I want to show you something that I had never seen before. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, Daniel talks about this abomination, and it is going to stand in the holy place. I'm going to have to get you to use uh, your sanctified imagination again for a minute, since I don't have a chalkboard. Remember the tabernacle that Moses was told to build, right? There was two rooms in that tent. What were the names of the two rooms? Holy place and most holy place. Holy place. Actually, let's do it this way. Holy place with my left hand. Most holy place. Who lived in the most holy place? God. His presence was there. In the Old Testament, and you can look this up for yourself, there was another name for the holy place. All throughout the Old Testament, it calls it the tabernacle of the congregation. This was God's tent. This was the congregation's tent. There's God and man. But guess what? There was something that separated the two of them. Right? What was it that was between the tabernacle of the congregation? A veil. A veil. Do you know what's amazing? 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20 says that veil was Jesus' flesh. Do you know what happened to the veil every year? Whenever people sinned, the priest would go in on any day of the year and he would take the blood and he would sprinkle it before the veil and on the veil. Our sins were being laid on Christ's flesh. Do you know what's amazing? How, what was the size difference between the most holy and the holy place? The holy place was bigger. How, it was, one was bigger. The, the holy place was bigger than the most holy. What was twice the size? The tabernacle or tent of the congregation, this is us, okay? All of us here. We're the congregation. This is our tent. Right out there, there's a veil right there at the edge, and there's another tent that's half the size of this. Exactly half the size. And I used to look at it and I was like, why? Why is it exactly half the size? And then I read the Hebrews chapter 10, and I was like, verse 18 through 20, and it said, the veil was Christ's flesh. And I was like, here's the congregation... Here's a veil that represents Christ's flesh, and on the other side is the presence of God. Isn't Jesus our mediator? Yeah. A mediator, mediator is somebody who stands between two people that are having a disagreement. God and man, he didn't have anything against us. We hated him because of our sin. And Christ had to come between the two of us. Now, I'm going to share something with you just to think about and to study, and you share with me what you find. Holy place, which is us, was twice as big as most holy place. And you see there's Jesus at the veil. What happened when Jesus died? But without hand, right? Do you know what else is interesting? No, it never did. It never did. Do you know why? Because God says, I've set before you now an open door. There's nothing standing between us and God anymore. If we confess our sins, he laid all of our sins on Jesus. Now let me share something with you. This is neat. How long in earth's history did we have from creation to Calvary? Roughly. 4,000 years. Do you know why we know that? There was a man named James Usher. Have you all ever heard of him? Usher's Chronology? I don't remember the date. It was like 1500s or 1600s. He read the Bible without any computer, and he went through every single genealogy and every age of every human being mentioned, and he went backwards from Calvary, and he showed us we had been here for 4,000 years before Calvary. <clears throat> now we're 2,000 after. Now look at that for a minute. 4,000 to get to Calvary, 2,000 after. Oh. Twice as big as the most holy. 4,000, 2,000. And the cross is right at the mark in the center. God has put this here to show us he's coming soon. He has come. It's almost over. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. He said, when you see the abomination that makes desolate, it's his temple that he wants to dwell in. But there are abominations that we allow to come into the temple that makes his temple desolate. His presence can't be there because of what we've allowed the devil to come in. He says, Whoso readeth, let him understand. And this is what Daniel prayed in Daniel 9. He said, O Lord, our King, according to all your righteousness I beseech thee, let your anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people have become a reproach to all that are about us. 
Do you know what pagans say about Christians? They say, that's foolishness. It's make-believe. They've got no power. They don't do anything. They don't, I mean, it's foolishness. They mock Christianity. We have become a reproach. That's why God said, I want the glory to come back. I'm going to cleanse you so I can put my spirit inside of you. And then look what Daniel prayed. He said, now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and our supplications. Let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem. Yea, thy holy mountain and thy people which are called by thy name. Whenever you see Jerusalem in the Bible, it's talking about us, God's people. Whenever you see Babylon, it's talking about Satan's people. And cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary, which is desolate. An abomination that had made the sanctuary desolate. Now I'm going to show you what Ezekiel says. And this is good. it's about to get really good. Trust me, don't lose me here. This is in Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel said, It came to pass that the hand of the Lord God fell upon me, and he took me by a lock of my hair. Can you imagine being there sleeping one night, and all of a sudden this hand grabs you and takes you? That happened to Ezekiel. He said, and the hand of the Lord God fell upon me, and he took me by a lock of my head, and he brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north. This is Jerusalem. We are God's city and his people. This is the north. It's north. That's why Satan said, I'm going to put my throne in the sides of the north. In here. It's upward towards the north. If you think about North Pole, you think about, i got to go up. To the door of the inner, inner gate, which looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy? What makes a man jealous if he's married? Hello? <laughs> what if a man... If your dad is married to your mom, what would make your dad jealous? Or what would make your mom jealous? That would be like upset, but that wouldn't necessarily be jealous. What was the other people? Yes. So if I'm if I'm walking along, you know, and I'm on my way back to the house and I say, I'm gonna stop by the, the mall for a minute and pick something up at the store. And I walk in there, and I'm looking, and there's my wife holding hands with another man. I would be like, what? What do you think my wife would do to me? It makes you jealous. God is jealous for us because we're his bride. I want a, a God that's jealous over me. I wouldn't want somebody to go, I don't care. You go out with whoever you want. I mean, how would that make you feel if your wife was like, I don't care if you're sleeping around. I don't care if you got other girlfriends. It doesn't matter to me. Have fun. I'd be like, what? God is saying, there's an image inside my temple that makes me jealous. Satan has gotten within the heart, and it makes God jealous for us. And then look what the Lord said. The Lord said to Ezekiel, Hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the chambers of their imagery? I'll look that word up in the concordance. It's imagination. He said, Ezekiel, do you see what the elders in our church are doing in their imaginations? Forget about the young people. Oh, we've got to do something about the youth. They're listening to rock and roll music. The old people are listening to rock and roll music. I had a lady that has been battling for years at an Adventist church, can't figure out what's wrong with her health. She has got a shrine in her house to Elvis Presley. She loves God, but she doesn't realize Elvis Presley professed to be worshiping the devil. He was so involved in the occult and martial arts, it wasn't even, it's not even funny. She has a shrine in her house. 
and doesn't know why there's these spiritual battles going on. He says, look what they do in the chambers of their imagination that I should have to go far off from my sanctuary, my temple. Isaiah says, how thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. That's us. We are Jerusalem. We are His people. I will be like the Most High. Satan said, I'm going to get the throne. And then the angel brought Ezekiel to the door of the court, and he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here, every man in the chambers of his imagination. For they say, The Lord sees not. Yea, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. Then the angel said unto me, Hast thou seen this? I wish you could see this image. I found it on the internet. It's a picture that somebody had done of graffiti on the side of a wall in a town. And you can see this, this lady over here. She's holding a cell phone up to her ear. She's got big colored paint all around her eyes and lipstick, and she's got these headphones on. And her eyes, when you look in her eyes, there's sadness. <clears throat> That's what you see in Hollywood in the music industry. They are living it up. You go, man, I would like to be like them. And then you, you don't see the pictures on television with them laying in the gutter or, or passed out and they don't know who they are or where they were last night. Or depressed and they're having to go to counseling to get help for getting over the depression. And then you've got this man that looks like a clown. His face is painted and he's got a smile on, but when you look in his eyes, he's... he's He's miserable. And he's holding one of those trophies you get like at the Golden Globe Awards or something. Son of man, hast thou seen what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here that I should go far from my sanctuary? So Ezekiel went in and he saw every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the walls round about. Now I want to ask you a question, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to. But we're not going to take names. I won't tell anybody. How many people in here have ever watched a Hollywood movie that they know they shouldn't have watched? Have you ever watched anything that you know if Jesus was here with me today, I wouldn't have watched that? Anybody? I have two. You know, when I was young, my parents, you know, we had a television, but it was black and white, and we could only watch two shows a week, Disney and um, Little House on the Prairie. But as I got older, I started going to visit friends, other people that were not as careful about what was shown. And I started watching other movies. Some of them were really, really not good. But do you know what was amazing to me? Every time that I would set something ungodly before my eyes, it was being painted on the walls of God's temple. You ever have a memory of something in the past that's not good? That's because it's in the memory. Your mind and your heart is God's temple. It's just like I watch a, a, a movie about somebody killing somebody. The devil comes in and he goes, I'm going to paint that picture right there on that wall so it never gets forgotten. That's what Ezekiel saw. The same way with music. I can remember when I was living for the devil in the world, even as a Seventh-day Adventist. And I was listening to that music, and you all know this. You can go in the grocery store, and they'll have a song on, and all of a sudden, you know the words. I used to work on a construction site with a, my partner, and he was a strong you know, Christian. And uh, we'd be on a construction site, and the guys on construction sites, a lot of times they play not good music. So they were on there, and we were working in the house, and all of a sudden the, guy came back, the guys came back from lunch. They flipped their, you know, portable stereo on, and it's ACDC, Back in Black, or Hell's Bells, or, 
you shook me all night long. And I was sitting there and I was like, I remember every word to this song. As soon as I heard the tune, it came back to me. And I was like, I can't do this. And my partner was in the other room working and I was in there running wire and I was like, Lord, I need help. And God said, start singing. They're, they're playing the devil's music, start singing. So I started singing Amazing Grace as loud as I could. I was like, Amazing Grace. And I'm putting these wires in. And my partner, Shannon, he came in a little while later and he said, Eric, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, Shannon, I said, that music is killing me. I said, I had to drown it out by singing Amazing Grace. He said, never thought of that. And a few minutes later, I hear him in the other room and he's singing. What we put in front of our eyes, what we allow to go in our ears, it goes in and it's painted on the walls of God's temple. But you want to know something beautiful? And I found this out. I said, Lord, you promised you blotted my sins out. You can go in on that wall of your temple and you can blot those images and those sounds and that music and those pictures and those memories. You can blot them out. Do you know what blotting out means? Erasing. Not like a computer, I mean like gone. It's never been there before. The Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes, for I hate the works of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Modern media, it's a medium. You remember we talked about that last night? The word media is the root word for the word medium. A medium is somebody who channels evil spirits. They speak for evil spirits. That's what the word media, that's where medium comes from. Hollywood is not normally speaking for God. There have been a few exceptions where godly movies are put out. Praise God for that. But 99% of them, it's the devil that's inspiring them. Well did Isaiah prophesy of these hypocrites. You know, it's funny because that's what the word actor is. Hi hypocrite. If you look up hypocrite in the Bible, it means actor. It's somebody who's pretending to be something they're not. Well did Isaiah prophesy of these hypocrites, these actors, saying, These people draw nigh to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus but their hearts are far from me. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones. The temple. Remember Jesus' disciples? They were like, Lord, look at this temple You know that Herod had fixed up. Thy servants take pleasure in her stones, and they favor the dust thereof. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. The temple was a symbol of what we're supposed to be. It wasn't the stones that made it beautiful or holy. It was God being inside. God designed that the temple at Jerusalem, and this is from Desire of Ages. Y'all remember we talked about that yesterday? What page was it? Does anybody remember? Uh, Don't look at the front. <laughs> Tell me. 161. Read Desire of Ages, page 161. God designed that the temple at Jerusalem should be a continual witness to the high destiny open to every soul. That temple was beautiful. It was beautiful. Everything in it was, was covered in gold. It, it glowed with God's presence. That was supposed to be us, like Adam. Before he sinned, he was the temple of God. He was literally glowing because God was inside him. But the Jews had not understood the significance of the building they regarded with so much pride. They did not yield themselves as holy temples for the divine spirit. The courts of the temple at Jerusalem filled with the tumult of unholy traffic. Have you ever heard of trafficking? Buying and selling. Trafficking. He said that's what was happening there. Do you know the Bible says that Babylon has fallen and she was uh, in her was found the blood of saints and, and the souls of men that have been bought and sold. It's talking about us. We have sold ourselves for our iniquities. Defiled, 
by the presence of sensual passion and unholy thoughts, the temple of our heart had been defiled. Now I want to show you, this is going to be a little bit touchy. So I'm, if, if somebody here feels uncomfortable, you're welcome to get up. But I'll, I wish that somebody had shown me these things when I was younger, when I was still a teenager or a young man or woman. I'm going to be careful how I describe because those of you that are older, you understand. God says, how has the faithful city become a harlot? He's talking about us. She was full of justice and righteousness dwelt within her, but now murderers. Her silver has become like dross. Her wine or grape juice has become diluted with water. Has anybody here ever gotten like Kool-Aid or pure grape juice before and that you accidentally mixed it with too much water? It says put two cups in there or two cans and you put four and you go to drink it and it doesn't, I mean, you just want to throw it out. It's no good. That's what God said happened to us. We were pure and we defiled ourselves. Now listen to what he says here in Isaiah. He says, as for my people which are called by my name, Children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err, and they destroy the way of your paths. That's not talking that, it's not saying that women are bad and men are better. But he's saying that women and children have taken the position over our lives as men of God. And I'm going to show you why. Cosmetic industry. And I know, I'll share this. I, I'm going to say this gently. Not condemning people. We're trying to make ourselves look like we didn't need it. Do you know how much money the cosmetic industry makes every year in the United States alone? One hundred and sixty billion dollars a year. That that's wild. One hundred and sixty billion. Now, this cosmetic. I'm going to be careful with this. It's a company that just came out recently called Urban Decay. One of the most popular growing cosmetic industries or lines. Now think about that for a minute. Urban. Urban is not country, it's city. Decay. You ever been in a rough part of town before? I mean, the rough part, the part of town that your mom and dad said don't ever go down there, where the bars are and the pool halls and the tattoo parlors and etc. That's what this is talking about, urban decay. The woman that they just got to become their icon is named Ruby Rose. Has anybody ever heard of her? Um, she's also, well, I'm going to show you later on in this message, she's also the new star, and she's playing the part of Batwoman. But she's coming out on television, not in the movies. She is bisexual openly, and that's why they chose her to play the part. That's why Urban Decay chose her to represent their products. And they said so. I found it on their website. They were like, this is why we chose her. She's a rebel. She's strong. She's strong-willed. And she represents what our company is doing. So what happens if somebody buys makeup from that company? Can it affect you? Yes. Can it, can it allow evil spirits to come into your home? Yes. Yeah. It can. And people say, well, it's just makeup to me. You find out and watch and see. Ask the Lord, anoint my eyes and cause me to see the spiritual battle that's being waged for my family. On the cover there, it says, bigger, blacker, and badder. That's, that's makeup line. It's one of the most popular in the world right now. How about Victoria's Secrets? Has anybody ever heard of that store? Okay. They are a popular... Um, undergarment store for women. And it, it's funny because 
there are certain types of films and certain types of magazines that a Christian should never look at. You all know what I'm talking about. If you walk by the mall and you look at the outside of the store, it's the same thing as looking at one of those books or magazines. Same thing. There's no difference. And I hope I don't offend people, but I'm going to share something with you. How many people have ever been to the beach before? Like a, a public beach where there's lots of people. How many people? Okay. I have two. The men have got boxer shorts on, which is called underwear if you buy them in a different section of the store. Same clothing, but it's boxer shorts. What are the women wearing? Bra and panties. Only it's called bathing suit if you buy it in a different part of the store. There's no difference in the garment. There's no difference in a bikini and a bra and panties. There's no difference. I would never, if DJ invited me over to his house and I walked over to his house and his wife was in there fixing dinner for us and she was in her underwear, I would get up and walk out. But yet we'll go to the beach and we'll sit there in front of thousands of people that have less clothes on than your wife or your mother when they're in their undergarments. And we think it's okay because we call it a different name. Women and children rule over the men. It doesn't mean they're bossing them. It means, remember Ahab? Who was Ahab married to? Jezebel. That's right, Jezebel. Jezebel. And rather than follow God and the prophet of God, he was attracted by Jezebel's beauty and he followed her to his death. Herod did the same thing. John the Baptist fought to win Herod's heart. And because of a woman, Herod gave up everything. Soul ties. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Even those of you that are young and you haven't even thought about girls, if you're a guy and you think girls are ugly, that's okay. Stay with it as long as you can. If you're a girl and you think guys are stupid, you're right. Stay with that as long as you can. But what I want to share with you is, and this is important, I wish that I had known this when I was 12 or 13 or 14. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, Know ye not that, you, that he which is joined to a harlot is one... What's that word? He that is joined to an ungodly woman is one body. For two, saith the Lord, shall be one flesh. Proverbs says, he shall be held with the cords of his sins. This is a soul tie. What I want to show you is, is what a soul tie is. And I want you to really focus on this. Um, it's when your heart is drawn out after something. If, if your heart is drawn out, guys, girls, just a little bit, okay? Whisper. If your heart is drawn out after a boy or after a girl, a tie can be formed, even without physical contact. It's like, I can remember when I went to, have you all ever heard of Cahetta Springs Camp? That's down in Georgia. It's a Seventh-day Adventist camp. I remember the year I went there when I was 11 or 12 years old. And I met a girl there. She was a nice girl, nice Seventh-day Adventist girl. And I thought I was, I was head over heels. I called my mom, and I was like, Mom, I want to stay for another week. My mom was like, you know, Eric, I mean, really? I was like, yes, I want to stay. She didn't know it was because this girl I'd met there. I'm 11 or 12 years old. I thought she had hung the moon. I thought she is so pretty. I, you know, when I came home from camp after the second week, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I mean, I thought the world had ended because I couldn't see this girl. She lived all the way down in Georgia, and I lived in Tennessee. I was 11 or 12 years old. A tie was formed because I looked at her and desired her. At 11 or 12 years old. When, I don't think how to put this. I've got to be careful because I'm, I'm used to speaking with adults. I've got, to be, I've got to reword things with younger people so they'll understand. Okay. 
a wedding. How many people have ever seen a wedding before? It can be on TV or live or whatever. Okay, a wedding. What happens, what happens normally is the father comes walking down the aisle with his daughter and he's going to give her away to the, the groom, right? Y'all don't remember that part? Okay, do you know what the pastor will say? He will say, who gives this lady's hand in marriage? And you go, wait a minute. I've been holding hands with this girl for three years. What do you mean give me her hand? I've been holding her hand all the time. What happens when you say the vows? After you say the vows, you know what the pastor will say? To the husband, you may now, what? I've been kissing her for two years. What's the big deal? The pastor's like, what? You may now do it. That's what it was supposed to be. In the old days, a hundred years ago, if you wore a white gown to a wedding, you had to be a virgin. You had to be pure. That's why the white gown. Women were terrified of being impure because it meant the day they got married, they would not be allowed to wear a white dress. Nowadays, people don't care. They'll wear a red dress, pink dress, blue. It doesn't make any difference. We've thrown purity out the door. When hands are held, a connection can happen. When you kiss someone, you're joined. That's why you see pagans, Buddhists, kissing the feet of Buddha. You see Roman Catholics who don't know better kissing the feet of some statue. It joins you to that person. When you go farther than that, like when a husband and a wife are together, you become one. Now what happens, the danger with that is this. And I'll, I'll give you a real example. When I was young, in my teens, I was probably 18 or 19, I started dating a girl. She was a nice girl. Um, I thought she was a nice girl. In my eyes, I thought she was a nice girl. Um, but that tie was, was formed between me and her. And after we broke up and I moved on, I started finding that there were things in my life that were not there before. Thoughts would come to my head that did not come before. Um, long story short, her mother was involved in witchcraft as well as her grandmother. She wasn't, but her mother and her grandmother were involved in witchcraft. That is a generational curse that can come upon a person unless they have faith in Christ and they confess it and they claim his blood. So by me being joined to this girl, emotionally in my heart, the spirit of witchcraft began to have power to influence my life, to put thoughts in my head that I never had experienced before. Now the good thing is this, the only thing that it takes to break a soul tie is faith in the blood of Christ. He said, whatsoever things we bind here on earth, will be bound in heaven. What the, whatsoever things we loose here on earth, he will loose in heaven. So if I say, Lord, I want the tie to be broken to this person, the Lord says, are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to give up that desire for them? I say, all of it. When I left my wife and I cheated on her and we got went through the divorce and you can watch that whole story, um, I was dating somebody else for almost five years. After I came back to my wife, I battled for almost a year to get rid of the thoughts of that previous relationship. I didn't understand. I was like, God, I did what you told me to do. I was afraid to go to sleep at nighttime because I'd have dreams about this other woman. And God finally showed me. He was like, you've got to break the tie. And I called these people that helped me, and I said, how do I fix this? They said, anything that has her name on it, anything that attaches her memory to you. If she gave you a card or she bought you a t-shirt, anything that attaches you to that other person, you go put it in the trash can or go set it on fire. Children don't do that unless you have your parents with you. Do you understand? The day that I did that, the tie was broken.
I said, God, I don't, I don't ever care if I ever see that person again. They're your daughter. I'm sorry that I hurt them and that I brought sin into their lives. Forgive me and break this tie. And he broke it instantly. Hold yourself for your husband, for your wife. And I'm gonna I'm gonna share this with you. Remember this. There's a film, a Christian film, not Adventist, but it's called Come What May. And it's about a young couple that meet in college, and it is the best movie that I have ever seen that teaches righteousness and purity like nothing else I've ever seen. You'll love the film. I mean, like, the film is unreal. Now I want to show you how this affects us with spiritualism. Hollywood, DC and Marvel Comics, anime and Japanese manga. Has anybody ever heard of manga or anime before? It's not manga. It's manga, yeah. I guess you've heard of it before. <laughs> Good job, Gio. What is that other phrase? Yin and... It's pronounced yang. Yang. Yin and yang. <laughs> it, it really is. I'm just giving you a hard time. That's called manga? Yes, it's called manga. Okay. Well, that actually makes sense because the pronunciation is similar in the Japanese to the Chinese. That's cool. Thank you for telling me that. So anime and Japanese manga. I want to show you, and I'm going to... I'm going to go past this. The devil used to catch us with blatant witchcraft. Now he's just painted witchcraft up and made it. He's dressed it up in a new package so we don't recognize it. Anime and manga. The one on the right is called Evangelion. I never was involved in anime or manga, but a lot of my students in the martial arts were. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's cartoons. It's for children. No, it's not. Most people that are involved in, in this field are between the age of 18 and 34 or 40. I mean, it, it's not kid stuff. This other one is called Spirited Away. It was one of the most blockbuster films that had ever been done. Disney bought the rights to the Japanese film so they could repackage it for America. But look at the name of it. It's called Spirited Away. And the little girl in the story, this Japanese story, she is being spoken to and directed in her path through evil spirits. Um, little Light Studios did a film called um, The Magic Kingdom, which we've got. And they talked about the film Pocahontas. Has anybody ever seen that film? In that film, Pocahontas goes into the woods and starts talking to this tree. And the tree forms a face like a witch, and she starts telling Pocahontas, the spirits will guide you. Pocahontas, it's a, it's a cartoon. It's supposed to be for children. And Disney is teaching them witchcraft. These are some of the other ones that were um, promoted by Disney. Uh, Howl's Moving Castle, Wolf Children, and Princess Mononoke. What's amazing is, I know it's hard to see, but this is the Disney cover, the American cover for that film. Let me show you what the Japanese cover looked like. Over on the far right, or on the far left for you, that's the original. The one in the middle is the one that was the English version that was made for the Japanese. You see what the little girl has? She has blood around her mouth. She's holding a mask in her right hand, and she has a dagger in her left hand. And she's got blood around her mouth. The Bible says we're not supposed to eat blood, right? Because the life is in the blood. And this is a little girl. This is supposed to be a children's movie. It's amazing to me, though, because what I started noticing was is that figure of the fox is all throughout Japanese animation even the Japanese culture. You see the Japanese lady here on the far right, and she's holding the mask up of the fox. The fox in Japanese is called Kitsune. And if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, help me. But I believe it's called Kitsune. The fox was known as a guardian spirit in the Japanese mythology or in their religion. So what they would say is, is that the fox would hide 
in this fox, you know, he would hide behind the mask of another. He would present himself in the form of a woman normally. And then after he had got your attention and trapped you in a relationship, then he would reveal his true nature. It was also interesting because according to Japanese tradition, the more tails that a fox has, the more spiritual power it has that it can give to you. Pokemon, they had that little fox. And it had one, two, three, four, five, six tails. That means it had six powers that it could give. But the fox was always hiding behind a mask, almost like the drama mask. This is what the Japanese definition or dictionary will explain about this. The Kitsune is a Japanese fox which is said to possess magical powers. Shape-shifting, which means it can change what it looks like. It might look like a woman, it might look like a dog, it might look like a fox, it might look like a man. It could change. That's demonic. It was said to possess ma magical powers and shape-shifting, the ability of illusion. It was known for deception, immorality, and sensuality. That's a fox. Guess where the English language got the term, she's a foxy woman. You ever heard that term before? She's a fox. That's where it came from. It's a woman that looks good on the outside, but she's going to deceive you on the inside. And I'm not picking on women. It was what they were saying. In the Japanese culture, and you can see here's a man who had joined himself to this woman, and after it was too late, after he had been trapped, the fox presented itself in its true nature. These were also known as Shinto Kami spirits. This is what they are known. This is the power they are known um, for possessing. They were spirit guides. They used mudras, mantras. Mudras are when you take your hands and you do a shape. Like this is called the sun seal. Or you see the Pope, he'll do this shape, which is the joining of heaven and earth. They're taught a lot, especially in ninjutsu. Because when you do those hand seals, it tells an evil spirit in the spirit world, I want your power. I want your presence in my life right now. Mudras, mantras. Mantras is a, is a pagan word. It's where you repeat a word over and over again in order to get an evil spirit to hear you. But yet we have Christians that say, oh, that's my mantra. That's, it's a pagan Hindu word. They use spells. They use chi energy. They heavily are involved in homosexuality, bisexuality, pedophilia, and transgenderism. Now I want to show you where this is today. Actually, let me do that first. The word inspired, it literally means inspirited. God's prophets were inspired because God's spirit went into them, caused them to write. In the occult, they call it automatic handwriting. You sit down, you open the mind up for an evil spirit, and all of a sudden your hand's writing, and you don't even know where the words came from. They use that in the occult. Inspired means inspirited. So when somebody says, I'm inspired, don't think that it means just by the Spirit of God. Marvel and DC Comics. How many people have heard of them? Right now, when I was young, when I was... 9, 10, and 11, I used to buy all kinds of comic books. I used to really like Iron Man and Spider-Man and Batman and all that junk. I had no idea what was really there. I had no idea what was really there. Right now, over the last 10 years or so, comic heroes are being portrayed in movies like never before. Like never before. Listen to this. This man, his name is Brian Singer. He is the writer and director for most of the X-Men movies, Marvel Comics. Listen to what he said. It says, Brian Singer has not only directed most of the movies, but he recruited openly gay activist actor Ian McKellen. Do you all know who Ian McKellen is? Do you know what he played in? He was Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. 
and he was uh, Magneto in the X-Men. Lord of the Rings. They got a man who's an openly supporter of homosexuality to play his part. What scared me was, do y'all, has anybody here ever watched Star Trek? Okay. They've got a new series that's been out for a couple of years. I don't watch that junk, but I know the series is out. Before that, they had another man who was bald that was the captain. What was his name? Do you know who I'm talking about, though? Do you know that there are pictures all over the internet of Ian McKellen and that man that played Captain Kirk kissing each other? They're both openly homosexual. And yet they're portrayed in Hollywood as being heroes. Brian Singer openly recruited Ian McKellen to star as Magento in the X-Men series by convincing him that the mutants, which are the characters in the X-Men, were comparable to struggling gays, gay people. And I'm not against gays. They need salvation, just like I need salvation. So you don't hate the person, but you hate what it is that's destroying them. McKellen stated, that's the actor, Ian McKellen, I think that Brian expected I was going to consider it a not posh enough job. But he revealed that he was told that X-Men is really about lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. He, he wanted to get Ian McKellen to play in the movie, and he was afraid Ian McKellen would think it's not a big enough movie. It's about superheroes. It's kind of a kid's movie. So the way he got him to play is he said, listen, he said, the X-Men is really just a parable about homosexuality. McKellen says, I thought he was right. It's not a fantasy story. It's a parable. So our children and our adults are going to watch X-Men and DC comic movies that are made by men and people that are purposely trying to persuade you that homosexuality is okay. McKellen is also the co-founder of the lesbian and gay activist group called Stonewall. This was back 30, 40 years ago at least, probably longer than that. I would say it was in the 60s. Here's three comics that have come out uh, recently. The Wonder Woman movie, if, it, if it's attractive, shut your eyes. Batgirl, the Batwoman uh, film that's coming out. The Wonder Woman movie, I thought, you know, certainly she has not, you know, gone bad. But I found a film clip where she was being interviewed at one of the movie uh, award ceremonies. And they were talking about, what do you think about homosexuality? And there was another lady up there on the stage with her, and she said, I don't think it's an issue. And she reached over and kissed her right on the mouth. Do you know what's frightening to me? People say, well, that's just now. It was okay back then. Do you know the writer of Wonder Woman? All the way back 30, 40, 50 years ago, she was told and portrayed that she was a homosexual, that she was lesbian, because she was a woman that lived on an entire island where there were only women, and yet they had offspring. The whole story was portraying that. And here we were made to believe that Wonder Woman was like a hero. <coughs> One of the new ones that's about to be released is called Catwoman. They interviewed the writer for the story, and this is what she said. The series writer confirmed that Catwoman's long time and literal flirtation and bisexuality was real. And that woman who played the part and wrote this, I'm sorry, the woman that wrote this said, for me, this was not a revelation so much as a confirmation. The more we talked about it, the more it was something I wanted to make happen. That's what she said about this film. I want to make this film and I want to portray Catwoman as what she really is. Now I want to get to the good part. I know we're going a little bit over on time, but this is important. The only begotten Son of God has looked upon the world and beheld human suffering and misery. With pity he has seen 
how his human agencies have been blinded by the deceptions of the enemy and sin. And we have become victims of satanic cruelty. He has seen how Satan has exalted men simply for the purpose of casting them down. How he has flattered them in order to draw them into his net and destroy them. Do you know who this man is? That's John Claude Van Damme. Has anybody ever seen He played in Bloodsport and a bunch of movies along. He was a martial artist and an actor. Look at his face. Look at his face. Look in his eyes. Listen to what the Lord said to us. Jesus looked upon the schemes by which Satan works to blot from the human soul every trace of likeness to God. He saw human beings possessed by devils. He saw satanic agencies incorporated with men. Incorporated. It means they become one with men. The very stamp of demons was impressed upon the countenances of men. And human faces reflected the expression of the legions of evil with which they were possessed. Legions. What if you have a spirit of bitterness because somebody hurt you? What if you got a spirit of unforgiveness? What about a spirit of resentment? What about a spirit of hate? What about a spirit of jealousy, a spirit of lust? Ellen White said one of the strongest demons that there are to overcome is the demon of appetite. Literally. So many Christians are struggling to overcome appetite, especially Seventh-day Adventists, and they're like, I can't get the victory, and they don't realize it's not you that you're fighting. You may have a spirit that has come into your, your life and influencing you and tormenting you. Marilyn Monroe. Her name was Norma Jean. She was actually a farm girl, and... She didn't look anything like this when she went for her first audition for a, a commercial. She had reddish, like strawberry red hair. She was pretty, but it was natural pretty, not this. Listen to what Marilyn Monroe said. Completely aware of her demonic possession, Monroe told a reporter that there were others who resided and lived inside of her. This is not my words. She described it as Jekyll and Hyde. That's exactly what Robin Williams said. Two in one, she said. More than two. I am so many people. They shock me sometimes. I wish it was just me. She had opened a door to the devil and evil angels, and she wanted out, and no one would tell her how to get out. When we see people that are struggling... We need to share what God did for them. Not in a, con a condemning way. Send them something in the mail. Because then they can read it alone and they will hear God talking to them. And if you see a Hollywood star and you say, they need help. Or a musician and you say, they need Jesus. Don't think that's impossible. A friend of mine who's a little bit older than me, he saw Marilyn Manson. You all know who that is? Oh, wow. Wow probably one of the most wicked, evil, devil-worshipping people in the music industry. And he was like, I wrote his name down on my prayer list and I started interceding for him every single day. And I'm claiming the blood of Christ over him. And you know what? With the internet, you can get on the internet with your mom and dad. You can look up a phone number or an e a mailing address. You can put a book in the mail to them and say, God, get that book to them. And God will send it. She said, they shock me sometimes. I wish it was just me. This is Marilyn Monroe when she wasn't so happy. You see her eyes? You see how depressed she looks? She's scared. They, the director said when, she was, when there was not a camera on her, that's what she looked like. But the moment somebody would say, Marilyn, let us get a picture, and they'd put a camera up or a video camera, she changed and became that. It was instantly... She was not that way. They said there was nothing fantastic about her until the camera turned on and then something changed. The picture over on the far left is her when they found her dead. She was not an old woman. She was 36 years old. She sold herself for fame and glory and she died at 36 years old. 
Do you know who that man is? Heath Ledger. He played in all kinds of Hollywood movies. He played the Joker. That was his last movie in the last Batman movie. The forces of darkness will unite with human agents who have given themselves into the control of Satan. Through yielding to satanic influences, when the devil tells you, and it may be through a friend, you have one of your friends at church and they say, hey, why don't you come over? My mom and dad are going to be out a little bit tonight. We can watch this great movie. It's not bad. There's no cursing in it. And you go, is it about Jesus? Well, no, but it's not bad. No, thank you. If you yield and watch it, it says we are yielding ourselves to the control of Satan. Through yielding to satanic influences, men and women will be transformed into fiends. That's demons. And those who were created in the image of God, who were formed to honor and create their, or glorify their creator, will become the habitation of demons. That's Revelation 18. Heath Ledger, he played the Joker in one of the uh, DC comic movies. Batman. He wanted to play the part so well because the last person that had played the Joker was Jack Nicholson. Do you all know who that is? An old actor? Jack Nicholson was not known to be a nice guy. He played some pretty bad parts in movies. Heath Ledger said, I want to I want to up him. I want to be able to play the part of Joker better than even Jack Nicholson did. You know what Jack Nicholson did when he heard that Heath Ledger had, had taken the part? He called him and he said, Heath, you don't know what you're getting into. I encourage you not to take the part. You know what Heath did? He said, to be the Joker, Joker in the comic books, children's comic books, Joker was said to be insane. He was a, a maniac, like a mass murderer. Anything that was evil and wicked, he did it. Heath Ledger said, the only way I'm going to be able to play this part if I can get inside of that head, that mindset. So he locked himself in a hotel room for almost 40 days alone. And while he was in that room, he watched every movie and read every book he could about people that were insane and serial killers and wickedness. Do you know what happened? The devil killed him. He committed suicide. They actually had to film the rest of the movie without him even being in it because he died trying to play that part. You know what was sad? The movie that he had played just before he acted the part of the Joker, it was called Brokeback Mountain. It was about homosexual cowboys. It was in theaters everywhere. Even in Johnson City, Tennessee, where we live, there were Christians outside protesting the theater that they were even showing a movie that showed men as cowboys being homosexual. It wasn't rated X, it was rated R. First time that's ever happened in America. He played that movie and everything went downhill from there. It was like he was sliding and he took a step off the deep end of the pool. He was 28 years old when the devil took his life. 28 years old. Now I wanna show you that this crosses all lines. This is a quote from Bruce Lee. How many people have heard of Bruce Lee? <laughs> These girls are like, I have no idea who that is. That's good. Bruce Lee was a, a famous martial artist, and he was also an actor. He said, Kung Fu is more than a system of fighting. It's a system of thought. You must outthink your opponent whatever form he takes. Because some of them, some of your opponents, your enemies, will be more than just men. We all have inner demons to fight. That was Bruce Lee. He was talking about the struggles he was having inside of his own heart and mind. Now listen to this. He said, I have come to discover through earnest personal experience and dedicated learning that ultimately the greatest help is self help. There is no other help but self-help. That was what Bruce Lee said. He was 32 years old when the devil took his life. 32. His son, who became an actor and was also a martial artist, he died after playing a movie called The Crow. He was 33. 
or 28. He was young, unbelievably young. Now, back to the light. Then came Jesus. Amen. 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 That means even in your life, if your marriage is struggling, if you've been through a divorce and gotten hurt, if you've got problems with guys wanting to beat you up, if you're struggling with sin and you can't seem to get the victory, this is the answer. Then came Jesus to restore in man the image of his maker. Jesus knows that a demon power, somebody read that for me. Is struggling in every soul. In how many souls? Every soul. Doesn't mean you're possessed, but he says there's a demon power that is struggling to have dominion in your life. Ellen White said every soul. Not some. Every soul. Remember, Judas just had a demon of uh, selfishness. People go, well, self God wouldn't keep me out of, self out of heaven for selfishness, would he? Yes. Yeah. Not because he doesn't want you there, but he can't have selfishness there. Especially if it's an evil spirit. He kicked them out the first time. He can't let them back in. He knows that a demon power is struggling in every soul, striving for the mastery and to reign. But Jesus came to break the power of Satan and to set the captives free. He came but for one purpose, and that was the salvation of the lost. Remember, salvation doesn't mean getting to heaven. It means freedom. Rescue, deliverance, healing, and restoration. All of it. It means all of it. You can look it up in your Strong's Concordance or on eSword on your computer. Look up the word salvation every place it's used and see what it means. And just to let you know this, it also means financial prosperity. Did you know that? I'm not a, I'm not a prosperity gospel person. But you know something? Jesus had no intention of finishing the work by a bunch of people that had got dirt to, to work with. He said, if you'll believe my word, I will give you what is needed to win every person. I'll give you what you need to provide for your family. And that doesn't mean bread and water. I grew up thinking the only glory as a Seventh-day Adventist is if I have nothing and I'm dirt poor. And then I kept reading the Bible and I was like, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, Abraham, Job, Solomon. Solomon was so blessed by God when he was serving God, it said that gold and silver were like the stones outside the city. That's literal. But God did that because Solomon was serving him. He wants our heart. Listen to what he says in Hosea. We're almost done. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but... Do you know what I grew up hearing? If you make your bed, you got to lie in it. As a man soweth, so shall he reap. And I was like, God, I've sowed so many bad, you know, terrible tares and weeds. I mean, I just got to live with this. And you know what Jesus said? Thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. I will be thy king. And that's what we're going to talk about on Sabbath. For where is any other that may save you in all of your cities? I will ransom you from the power of the grave. I will redeem you from death. O oh, death, I will be your plagues. O oh, grave, I will be your destruction. And repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. That's what Christ said he'll do to Satan who's trying to hurt you and your family. In the cleansing of the temple, Jesus was announcing his mission as the Messiah. That word Messiah is only found twice in the Old Testament scriptures. Both of them are in Daniel. Go to Daniel chapter 9 and see what the mission of the Messiah was. He was announcing his mission as the Messiah in doing what? In cleansing the temple. We are the temple that he came to clean. And he was entering upon his work. What was his work? 
she says it was to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin, from the earthly desires, from the selfish lust, and from the evil, evil habits that corrupt the soul. That temple erected for the abode of the divine presence was designed to be an object lesson for Israel and for the world. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once in a little while I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. You know what the desire of every human being has been? ever since Adam and Eve fell, to have the glory again. That's why women put on all the makeup. That's why men work out. They're like, somebody notice me. Somebody recognize that I'm important. But do you know what? When you realize what Christ did for you, you realize how important you are. You are not lost. You are not a sinner. You have been saved. You are a son and daughter of the Most High God. He says, the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory. My temple, your heart and your body, I will fill with glory. Do you remember Stephen when they were about to stone him? What did they say? His face was glowing like an angel. Remember Moses when he came down from the mountain? His face was glowing. That's what God promises to do for all of us. And the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. Instead of it being a temple made out of stone, it will be the temple of our hearts. And he says, in this place, I will give peace between man and God. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. And princes, his sons and daughters, shall rule in justice and in mercy shall the throne be established. What was that thing called on top of the Ark of the Covenant? Mercy. The mercy seat. In mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in verity in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and hasting righteousness. It means causing righteousness to flow like water. Righteousness is perfection. Come here for a minute. Can I bother you? Come help me for a minute. What's your name? Audrey. 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 Okay. She is an attractive young lady. What would your goal be if you could if you could say anything? If you could choose anything in the world as far as yourself, what would you want to change? Or what would you want yourself to become? What would you like to look like? What would you like to be like? Do you want to be tall? What, what do you want to do in school? What do you want to do for a career? I want to be a teacher. Amen. That's what my wife is. That's a good, that's a good thing. Would you like to be the kind of teacher like Solomon was? I mean, can you imagine if you went in and you taught a class and everybody went home and they were like making straight A's? Everybody was making straight A's. That tells you you got a good teacher, doesn't it? Right? That's what God thank you. That's what God wants to do. Righteousness is perfection. He wants to make us perfect again, but he can only do it by faith. Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And you know what Ellen White was inspired to write? She said that command was a promise. And I wake up in the morning, you don't walk around telling other people that. That's something you talk to God about. Lord, perfect your work and your life in me. And thank you. He shall sit upon the throne, hasting righteousness until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and our wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is reckoned as a forest. Do you know sometimes in our country here in America, we say reckon. What's the word reckon? Well, I reckon so. Kind of, maybe, sort of. Right? I reckon. That's not what it means in the Bible. Reckon means it's counted, and it is. When you're reckoning, it's a mathematical term. You reckon 
you count to see how much is there. He says, I went to the fruitful field and I counted and it was a forest. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness shall be quietness and assurance forever. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion, my city and my people which are called by my name, for hence, from henceforth forever. And thou, listen to this, and thou, O tower of the flock, that's talking about our King and our Savior, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion. Yea, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Do you know what God is saying to you and I right there? Jesus said, you're my bride, I'm the king. If I'm the king, I have power and authority over everything. If you're my bride, you have power and authority over everything. That's why he told his disciples, I give you power and authority over every evil spirit to cast them out. Do you know what else he said? I also give you power and authority to lay hands on the sick, and they shall be healed. He didn't say might be, could be, sort of be. He said they will be. He wants us to begin to read those promises and take hold of them. Last slide. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. It means he won't stop working until our righteousness thereof shines forth as brightness and our salvation shines thereof as a lamp that burneth. God promised us that. Christ said we are his workmanship. We're the work of his hands. If we'll just open the heart and let him come in. But you've got to read the promises and read them out loud. And read your name into every promise. Try it. Try it for one week. Read every time you read the Bible, read it out loud. And every time you read a promise, put your name into it. In one week, I promise you, you will see a night and day difference happen in your walk with Christ. You'll start hearing Him literally talk to you. You'll be reading and He'll be talking and you'll know it's Him. Amen. Let's pray. Actually, DJ, would you pray for us? You pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this message, for all the knowledge that you give to us about how the, the devil works and how you can find the freedom in you. And we ask for your Holy Spirit that can work in our hearts and that we can, we can surrender our lives to you every day, every morning. And we give, receive your peace and all the blessings that you reserve for us. Thank you for everything and stay with us in this camp meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I hope you guys have a wonderful evening, and I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow.